Okay. So perhaps we can just begin by um, taking a moment to look around the environment we are in, using our eyes very slowly, looking around, allowing the neck and shoulders to follow, and just noticing what's in this environment. Perhaps this is a stable, safe place for you to be in. Just noticing colors and shapes. And becoming aware of the seat that you are on. Noticing the contact points, the body with the seat. Noticing perhaps the feet on the floor. Just taking a moment to check in with the body, doing a quick body scan, noticing what is here now. Just being aware of that. Taking a moment to expand awareness to notice Whatever is here in this breathing body, and expanding just a little outside the skin, becoming aware of the air on the skin, perhaps clothing, and becoming aware of the space around you. Just noticing how this space around you holds you. And then perhaps noticing whatever the body needs right now, whether it's a wiggle, but just a sitting still, whatever is here, inviting and noticing and allowing you to respond to that. And as you open your eyes, to take a moment to look at who else is in the room with you and offering them a smile and saying hello and welcome. Great, welcome everybody. It's so wonderful that you could be here and this is very exciting for me. And um, let's just uh, do some intros. So Lucille, I'm gonna I'm not gonna introduce you. I'd love you to introduce yourself. Uh, thanks, Ingrid. So um, there's lots of people that already know me that are here, some of you who don't, but um I think maybe the important things to say here today is um I have been on a journey relating to the Enneagram for it's almost coming on 20 years now. And um, one of the things that I love about the Enneagram is how it keeps shape shifting, um, not just in how it speaks to me, but also in what it offers, I think, more broadly. Um, and after meeting the Enneagram and the ideas of levels of health and integration and things like that inside the Enneagram, Later on, I um, met some of the ideas and theories around adult development or vertical development. And I've spent about a decade in conversation with those. So I'm offering those two things here today. I'm really, really interested in the ways in which we can support not just ourselves, but also the system, um, the world that we live in and our relationship with all the non-human beings and non-beings in the world into a place of healthy relationship. Um, yeah, and when I'm not busy with this kind of development work and organizational systems change, I love raising my chickens and growing vegetables. <laughs> and I have got seven chickens 
all with different Enneagram styles. So if there are any other fellow chicken lovers here, let me know if you've also typed your chickens or if that's just a particular problem that I'm struggling with at this point in my life. So yeah, it's lovely to be here, Ingrid. And I'm part of the Euphoria group and um, we have some cool assessments and stuff. That's not why we're here today, but yeah, anyone who wants to know more can reach out to me. Thanks for that intro, Lucille. Always so low key and underplaying what you do. I've been following Lucille around for a long time. She was one of my first Enneagram teachers and a deeply transformative person in my world. Then she was my teacher of adult ego maturity. And I recently went on the most incredible Enneagram on the land retreat with Lucille. And I hope she's not embarrassed to be called the magician, hierophant, witch, shaman. I don't know what word you'd like to use for someone who creates magic and meaning and beauty in this world. So I cannot thank Lucille enough for being in the world. So really Thanks, want to create spaces like this. This is my big joy, to create spaces where healers and teachers and people with a significant calling in this world at this time can come together and realize they're not alone, to connect, resource each other, to do the work that we do, to remind each other of the significance of this work, and to, to keep that inner sense of being resourced with this deep purpose and orientation to life and a knowledge of what we serve. And you know, I, I, I kind of have a deep faith that everyone here is serving love ultimately. So that's that's my kind of trip. And um, yeah, so uh, Takdir, the organization I run, Enneagram training, teaching, coaching, whatever. Um, so yeah, Lucille being here, the topic that we said we were going to talk about and I use the word dialogos, and what we mean by that is the difference between dialectic and dialogos. And these sessions that I want to continue to host on a monthly basis are about the move from dialectic to dialogos, which is about analytical, um, logical, rational, analytical thinking towards a process dialogue in relationship where we're making meaning together. And that's what John Babeki talks about, he's the cognitive scientist, about reciprocal opening. That in dialogos, we transform one another. As we come into contact and as we create meaning together, it's a very transformative process. And what it is characterized by is deep listening, open-mindedness, embracing paradox, and really um, a love of wisdom, like fostering integrated wisdom within each of us. So that's my intention in hosting the space. And then from a topic perspective, these are the questions that were in the email that came from Euphoria. And what I'd like to do is if you could put in the chat, which of these questions interests you most? And if your concern or interest in being here is not one of these questions, can you put your question in the chat so that we can be really responsive to why you're here? It's not a lecture, it's a conversation and a deep engagement. Lucille and I haven't really aligned around what's going to happen. So, you know, ask, ask your thing. Tell us why you're here. Yeah, and you can pop that in the chat box and um, continue to pop some things in the chat mm -hmm. as we go along. Yeah. 
Question four, critiques. That's my big trip as well. I love that. Three and five. Yes. Great. Cool. Great. 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 Lovely. Lovely. Okay, so no one has said number one, which is interesting to me because I personally am not exactly sure what I mean by that. And I think we should maybe clarify because we might have all different assumptions about what it means. Yeah. Manya, to answer your question, the questions are on the screen. I don't know if you can see them. Um, yeah. Asking where are the questions yeah. there. Mm. Yeah. So there are some ones coming through as well. So um, we kind of all, all, all over the place, it seems. Correct. Um, so we can just that. jump in there. And, and please, if there are any other questions, like what question are we not asking? If you can please put that in the chat. And that's one of my favorite questions that I've started enjoying a lot in my corporate work is what question are we not asking? Let's ask that question a lot. So, okay, Lucille, so question one, what is leveling up? And I took that uh, screenshot yeah. from one of your reports. So I'm going to put this here. So, so maybe you can help us understand what's going on here. Your yeah of leveling up versus the Enneagram levels of development. What's going on here? Yeah. So I think the, the first thing to notice is one of the wonderful things about the Enneagram is that it has this story of, and leveling up is maybe one of the ways in which we speak about it. Other terminology you'll hear at the moment a lot is the word vertical development which is a potentially problematic term, but we can work with that too, or adult development, or stage theories. These are all different things that we talk about. So one of the things that's really amazing about the Enneagram is that it has a story around leveling up inside it. Um, at its most basic, it has to do with the levels of health. Um, and if we if we working with uh, Don and Russ's work, we'll know that there are nine levels of health. If we're working a little bit more with a kind of ginger type approach, we'll say that there are three levels of health. So there's different levels of health inside each of the types. And we innately know this about ourselves too. We know that there's a version of me that um, is more unhealthy and one that is more um, healthy and more towards the liberated sides of that and it's interesting because we can be in many of those places in a fairly short period of time and then of course if we unpack further within the Enneagram there's also the story of how the symbol as a process symbol can support that so from my point on the Enneagram I have next door neighbors the next door neighbors have something to say about how I grow and adapt to my environment and we've got the lines from my types and so the lines from my types give me another story around how to um, maybe extend even further from myself. So these are all mechanisms inside the Enneagram. And then we've got the law of one, the law of uh, unity and wholeness and the circle as a whole. And that's also a story around how to in some way level up by returning to the state of wholeness inside the circle. So that's part of, I think, why many of us here that work with the Enneagram love the Enneagram so much, because it does have an in a built-in story around this innate idea of how to grow, expand, overcome my ego structures, move in some way from the process of my fixations and my vices into something that is more, more expressive of the virtues and the holy ideas that are always part of who we are and what's possible for us. So that's the Enneagram side. Now, if we work, walk away from the Enneagram world for a moment, there are lots of people in lots of different parts of the, the world that's interested in human development that have been looking at people and going, what are the different stages of human development? Starting from childhood all the way through into um, the later stages of our life. 
Now, there are different strands inside that. Ego development is one strand. Um, and here we're looking at the, the work of people like Suzanne cook Greuter, of Bill Torbett, um, of Keegan, um, and also the work that we do at Euphoria, where we've brought Africana existentialism and liberation ethics into conversation with ego development, which has maybe more of a, a, a combination of, of social development um, and existential development linked to ego development. And there are other stage theories too. There's ideas around cultural development, around moral development, the development of spirituality and faith systems, cognitive development. There are many of these strands that go, what are the stages that are less visible for, from the outside? As children, we can see when people grow. We can see you couldn't walk and now you can walk. You had 10 words in your vocabulary, now you have 200. You know, and there's object permanence and a whole lot of things like that that come into um, what we offer. But as adults, a lot of this inner expansion, this inner growth is quite invisible. And people have been studying it far away from the Enneagram community. Um, and there's some really good theory around that. Now, in the work that we do, um, we look at what we call the conventional stages of development which is the self-protecting, conforming, specializing, and performing stages that all have to do with, in some way, growing into more of my agency in the world within, in some way, the bounds, the norms of society as it is expressed at this point in time. And then we have what we call the post-conventional stages, internalizing, strategizing, transforming, and being, that have to do with my agency being expressed into also departing from the norms and the storylines um, that have been offered to me through my culture, through the world in which it operates at this point in time. And as I grow from these early conventional stages that can be in some way um, thought to be more, uh, in some way defending, so more directly and often in conversation with my defensive structures, the later stages are stages where, yes, the defenses are still there. Um, I don't necessarily get rid of them. And I am also in the process of moving towards something, not just defending myself against something, but also moving towards something. And an ever more complex, dense identity. Yeah, at very early stages, often my identity is, I mean, if you think of your life as a barrel, um, at the early stages, maybe there's only three or four pickles in this barrel. And as I grow and develop, this barrel fills up with pickles and there's a lot more that's happening in there. Um, and in some ways, also a lot less. Now, one of the things that I just say up front and Ingrid, then we'll get into the conversation is... Yeah. Stop you there, Lucille, please. Um, I don't feel like a barrel of pickles. And there were two words that really <laughs> stood out for me in what you said. Complex and dense. Can we, mm. can we explore what complexity and density means? My big passion in my work is changing people's self-experience. And in my session with Euphoria, it's... I'd love to understand more about density and complexity before you go on, if that's okay. Yeah, cool. I think we can take the slide off. I don't think we need that so much. Um, so I think there's one way in which we we all maybe potentially share a bit of an understanding around complexity. We'll start there. And a lot of that has to do with maybe cognitive complexity. And that's a good starting point, but it's not the only point we have. So this idea of um, not just how many variables I can work with, but also being able to work with the nonlinear aspects of the relationship between those variables and my comfort or discomfort with the anxiety that comes with having this sense that there are many complex things linked to each other and there's no formula that's going to solve how we get from A to B because it's too interrelated. So there's that version of complexity. I think there's also something around 
thinking about complexity from an identity perspective. Um, if I, and, and I'll do some, I'll, maybe I'll offer a generic example and then go into the Enneagram here to also help us understand this. If I'm very um, early on in my ego development, my identity development process, I might have a couple of parts of my identity that really have a lot of substance behind them. So I am this culture, I'm this gender, um, I have this kind of professional occupation and specialization. So I have a couple of things that I hang my hat on. And maybe even then from an Enneagram perspective, I have an idea of I'm an Enneagram 8 or I'm an Enneagram 6 or I'm an Enneagram 1. And that means that I am um, quite responsible and I'm structured and, you know, I like the detail, whatever my story is. And I have an inner motivation around that. As my identity becomes more complex, and this is something that I know, Renata, you're very interested in as well. The capacity to hold the polarity in my identity is vastly expanded. And that's more complex. If I, for me, from an Enneagram One perspective, I can hold that I am good and bad. And the fact that I am in relationship with some of my flaws and faults doesn't mean that I immediately need to fix them or that in some way that means that I'm going to end up in the lowest levels of Dante's uh, versions of hell. It's just that everyone carries a shadow. Now, all of a sudden, my identity is a lot more complex. Um, and, and that's part of what the Enneagram invites us to do is not to hang our hats on a simple version of what a very sloppy stereotyped understanding of the number that I can probably follow quite extensively in a whole lot of interesting um, videos on social media platforms saying, if you're a one, then this, if you're a two, then you're going to do lockdown like this or whatever it is that we're superficially unpacking with, with the Enneagram, to understanding the Enneagram as an invitation to figure out which parts of myself I've either buried or lost or disowned. And in bringing myself back into conversation with those pieces, my identity becomes more complex. My identity expands. And that's part of maybe the question that we can then work with is, and it becomes more dense. It's more densely populated. There's more there. Um, mm. And so when, when I also have, comp, uh, when I have experiences that disrupt my way of seeing myself or my world, there's more to hold it. That's the densification. Yeah. Um, let, let me just yeah. uh, I want to bring some really cool cognitive science language to what you say. And anybody who ever has a conversation with me is going to hear about John Bavaki. Um, he, he's a, a cognitive scientist at the University of Toronto. I know Lucille's almost as much of a groupie as I am, um, but I'm number one groupie. Um, he, he speaks about complexification as a combination of differentiation and integration. So yeah. what you're talking about is knowing, discovering, and realizing, uncovering the fact that there are so many multiple parts and they they seem so contradictory and paradoxes and polarities in the self. So the complexification is shining a light on these are these are so differentiated. But then the integration, as we complexify, is that somehow they hang together. And like I hear. Yes. So it's that combination of differentiation plus integration equals complexification. So that seemed to describe nicely what you're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, another more everyday analogy. My sister is an occupational therapist. And she has one of the coolest things in her in her consultation room is she has these um, very simple, stretchy fabrics that hang on two hooks. And there's like about 20 layers of these fabrics. Now, I know for certain if I jumped on just one of those, they tear and I'd end up on the floor in a little puddle. But as my identity 
complexifies, densifies, and coheres. It's like adding more and more of these layers to the point where you can have a whole family jumping onto these 20, just thin pieces of stretchy fabric. And it holds us all. And not only does it hold us, but it comforts us mm. and enables us to go towards some of the scary, potentially traumatizing, you know, sympathetic nervous system activating moments in our lives feeling held and sometimes we think that we need tools to do that and actually the more foundational principle here is that who we are can do that for us it's our identity it's our identity the way in which our identities um, develop that can do this for us we don't need clever tools beautiful and there you've kind of implicitly given, given us a definition of density as the coherence, the layering, the, the integration have, creates density. And then you mentioned the comfort and you mentioned trauma in the nervous system. And that's like a big part of my teaching around trauma-informed Enneagram work is the regulation of the nervous system as the foundation of identity, that when it feels yep. okay to be safely embodied, our identity feels safe and we can yep. hold our experience. So we can be okay with the fact that sometimes we're depressed and suicidal and sometimes we're elated and sometimes we're evil and sometimes we, you know, there's there's like a an inner foundation. Um, like Thich Nhat Hanh speaks about being a home to oneself. Mm. Yeah, I love that. And I think even if we strip out even more of the psychological and just go into the pure somatic part of this, Ingrid, I mean, one version of thinking about this is that our capacity to to be with some of this discomfort sits in our breath. And so if we can um, build our capacity for carbon dioxide in our bodies, We can hold a lot more of the trauma or potentially disruptive things that are happening in our world. And so I love, you know, it's one of the questions we jump ahead to a little bit, but what are some of the non-psychological ways of working with this? Um, We can work with it incredibly somatically just through the breath. And that's that's something that I'm finding very liberating in my world and practice at the moment. But this notion of going, so what happens? to me when I hold my out breath. I breathe in and out and there at the place of my empty lungs, I just hold it and I hold it some more and I hold it some more and some more. And at this point, the CO2 levels in my body are actually building up. And part of what CO2 does is actually allows the oxygen to do its work, which is, yeah, just um, an interesting aside. Please breathe if you haven't done so yet, um, any of you holding your breath. But the core thing is sometimes we think we need to do all of this complex psychological work where actually so much of our capacity to be with what is uncomfortable can be cultivated through the body. And if my capacity, for holding my out breath can be a supportive way of being in the world, then sometimes we don't need to talk about it that much. (laughs) And trauma restricts our capacity to be in the here and now in our body. You know, trauma causes dissociation and interpersonal unsafety. And, you know, we've got Leela here who studied with Wendy Palmer and is doing the Aletheia coaching, which is all about building this capacity to be with the different inner parts as well. And is it okay if if uh, if we ask for affliction here? I just know the depth of wisdom of some of the people in this room. And I just love to to ask, like Lila, can can you jump in here? And what what is your sense of this somatic capacity for being with ourselves? Thanks, Ingrid. Uh, yeah, it's um, 
Yeah, I, I like what uh, Lucille speaks to about these different, and I'm going to use the word parts of ourselves that we come to to know, and then how we we integrate that with how we are now, and that creates that density. So with the parts work, with the work that I'm doing at the moment is what we really want to do is to kind of have a, a better and a, a closer relationship with these parts of ourselves. And every part has a positive intention. It just has a negative side effect. So when we start to build that relationship with the parts of ourselves that we've kind of really either forgotten, as Lucille said earlier, or we know and we don't like, we start to build a, a relationship and we start to get to know the parts. Once the parts feel seen, understood, and valued, it starts to soften a bit. And when that softens, this presence, this, this innate resources that we do have, gets an opportunity to rise up and shine and be there. So we get more highly resourced when we when our, we have better relationship with our parts and the parts soften a bit. So yeah. Yeah, and I think that helps to hold all of that complexity and that density with a little lot more. Uh, yeah, for me, it's it's compassion and love, actually. Yeah, I love what you're saying there, Lila. This idea of as we as we engage with the parts, and I mean, part of that is just seeing the parts to start off with, which mm -hmm. is like I need to go in there and look for some of these parts in me that maybe if I'm in a more numb state, I'm not aware of. But once I can see them, I can love them back into coherence. And I think that's where some of the vertical development leveling up ideas can become problematic in the kind of connotations towards striving that come with some of these models and frameworks. We think that the way and, and the way in which we can language this is very it's like almost a masculine way of competitively moving from one stage to the next and striving and striving and striving. And, you know, once I'm here, I have to get to the next stage. And the purpose of all of this is to get to the winning line at the end and be at the final stage. And, and that's actually not how much of this works. A lot of it actually works in this process of unfolding and allowing and loving it into co cohering and also being okay with, with, with really where we're at. We often say as coaches, you have to meet your client where they're at. I think this is part of the inner work when, we, when we're working with ideas of growth is we also need to love and meet ourselves where we're at. And where we're at is not something to solve for always. Um, so we we in some of the critique of the theory, and it is really lovely to have a roadmap that gives us some idea of maybe what what is useful in that pathway of loving ourselves into coherence. Mm. So there, like if we are segueing into critiques, like you you mentioned the metaphor of a roadmap, which. Mm implies that there is a road and mm. there is a normative element to that that there is a somewhere to get to and I know you're extremely familiar with with the critiques of these models and specifically Dave Snowden's critique is that who are we to kind of evaluate where someone is at or to give them any direction in terms of a, a destination like to impose and and so I'd just like to ask you if you now it seems opportune to explore the critique of universalism like here we've mm. got Western framework it comes from California or whatever with the history in Western philosophy sometimes Neoplatonism then this like with the colonial mindset of we can say what's universal like can I put that critique here and we explore that. Yeah, I think there is something about, so if, if we're talking about principles of coherence, 
we are in some way also talking of the principle, not just of fragmentation and individualization, but also of the principles of coming together and meta, meta, meta maps. Yeah. And the problem with meta maps is that it can be a colonial kind of way of thinking, right? So if I am too attached to the meta map and I turn the meta map into an instruction manual for an individual, it's very far from the meta level, then it is really problematic. Yeah. Um, so that's the first thing. So I agree with that as a criticism. And I think part of that um, has to do with our capacity as practitioners of development to be aware of how we're using all our maps, including the Enneagram. The Enneagram is a map that can also be used in a, in a very acontextual, very dangerous way that, that leads to us shoving ideas about ego structures, defenses, what is virtue, um, what is holy even, if we take the spiritual side, that liberation in the levels of health is an outcome that we should strive for, that it's not okay to be expressing this defense, whatever it is that we can do, we can shove our frameworks into humans. And that is, um, that's the danger of all frameworks, including, I'm going to be slightly naughty, including frameworks, even if they are constructed through the lived experience of each situation we're in but even something like the Kinevan framework is a framework that can be used in that way and I know Dave con constantly says you have to reconstruct it from whatever and that's great and that's why it keeps changing language and that's why we should also be willing to change our language around development but that can also be used in a colonial way right and it's a performance of contradiction to yeah. say Kinevan is better than the Enneagram or you know to insist I'm yeah, um, I we go down that rabbit hole. But you know yeah. what I absolutely loved is the metaphor of an instruction manual. Like yeah. nothing is an instruction manual for the human psyche. Like the way, I mean, my phenomenological experience is each person is an emanation of the ground of being and mystery. I mean, on my whole esoteric kind of cosmology and worldview. Um, the idea of an instruction manual for a person for me, is they're so incommensurable. And yep. that's that's the ethos that I want to pursue is how do we use the Enneagram in a way that it's not what Steve Marsh calls a colonizing discourse, where we yep. the model and we say, this is how you should see yourself. This is, yep. you need to look at these categories and then you need to say, that's me, that's me, that's me. And if you don't do that, I'm going to work on you until you do. And as coaches, for us to come with this tool and to think we experts about someone else's personality. And in my 5D coach training, it's like, do not interpret someone else and do things like, Lucille, I can hear your fall. It's like, no, no. Don't invent yeah. someone's psyche with your interpretation. And I'd love to, I mean, that's for me the biggest critique of models is how they get inserted into someone's brain. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that is where, when we're doing this, what we're actually doing is we're potentially leveling down human beings. We're, we're constricting identity, we're boxing. And, I, you know, we can very glibly say, don't use the Enneagram to do that. But the moment we come from the certainty about an individual that's informed by an external framework, mm -hmm. we're doing exactly that. So for me, the invitation is to say, how can I use my frameworks, whether it's one that has to do with stage theories or one that is the Enneagram, how can I hold them alongside the conversation? And the conversation is the contextual conversation about this human being. And then from this place of holding the framework here next to the human being say, is there anything useful here that can inform where you're going with this? 
And so that's really the, the positioning that we want to do if we're leveling up our practice around that, which means that we need to become a lot less certain and we, be, we need to become a lot less prescriptive around, you know, the line of integration for your Enneagram type is X. And therefore, you know, you need to be doing this. So we can say there are, the, the lines may have something to say here. If you were to look at the invitations inside this other point, what, what do you want to take on board? And is there anything there for you? So the interesting thing is that we are sloppy in our Enneagram work when we're certain. It's a little bit of a mind bender. Yeah. And we are, we are a lot more um, invitational into this process of leveling up my identity, if we want to use that word, um, if we are less precise and more invitational and yeah. more con always from context, always from the context not from the framework. What's my starting point? Is like, let me tell you about the Enneagram. That's a dangerous starting point. The starting point is, tell me about your context. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So that it's a, that's the difference also between dialectic and dialogos is I'm here yeah. with you and we're yeah. in conversation and you read this report and how would you like to have this conversation? Is there stuff, you know, about the report that was interesting to you? And and like staying in contact with the contextually embedded moment with somebody. And yeah, yeah I just, I really love the way you're speaking because there's a, a consciousness of the power of discourse and the power of knowledge. And mm. we assume power over somebody because we've got some knowledge system. And then we yep. use it in a way that it gives us security. It's like our little security blanket, you know. We've got the Enneagram and we've got answers about you. So I don't have to be uncomfortable about the fact that I know nothing, which is which yeah. free range. You know, you and I are in free range conversation here. And mm -hmm. that's Dialogos, where things just unfold and we're encountering and we get surprised by each other and, you know, there's real growth that happens in that space. Yeah. Yeah. And so here's the interesting thing. As, as a person working with another human being, I can always ask myself, what is the field we're playing on here? Are we playing on the field of this human's context in life? Or are we playing on the field of the Enneagram or the field of an adult development framework because if the field becomes the framework you know i've i've lost the person so i want to say one or two things about maybe that question what does it feel like to level up yeah because i i think we're in a very interesting conversation and i'm realizing some people may want to talk about two and five and some of the other questions we have too is that okay ingrid <laughs> yeah cool so this idea of when I'm moving, so Bill Torbett's language is very interesting here. He says, I'm moving from one action logic to another. Okay, so the, and the logic that I'm using to evaluate what's true and therefore what I base my decisions on is a certain field in which some data is available and visible and some data is not available and visible. So as I encounter a shift in action logic, different, it's almost like you think that it's the dark night and all of a sudden you, you see all the fluorescence that's, that's visible um, and more things become visible than, than was there before. Whoa, that's the process of leveling up. Now, this isn't always in a moment of enlightenment that hits us like a lightning bolt. This happens over time where we realize, wow, I'm paying more attention to this kind of data. Before, I was really interested in all the quantitative data that's part of my life and my world and my work. And all of a sudden, I'm realizing that there was part of the picture missing. And maybe that's qualitative. I remember when this happened for me very early on in my career, my job was to build 
simulations of complex adaptive systems. And I had very clever technology and we could go, okay, give me a hundred thousand variables. I'll build a, build a system for you. I'll show you how the manganese market of the world works. Yeah. So wonderful. This is data points. This is what I see. This is my action logic. Then I got the request to build one of these complex adaptive models to simulate why people, why there were so many disabling um, injuries on specific um, mining sites and manufacturing sites. And I did my thing that I'd done up to then. I built my models and I couldn't find the model that explained all of it. It could explain some of it, you know, could simulate some of it, but it, you know, and that kind of model. And then you get to the place where you go, there's no predictive model for when some person is going to decide to do something stupid in the middle of the night and drive the truck into the wall. There is no model for that, right? But then all of a sudden, the part of the world that became visible for me as my model stopped working was I started seeing how different lives at the mine had different values attached to it and how some people had become commodified and objectified mostly people with living in black bodies as opposed to people living in white bodies who were mostly at that point in time in the 90s, the people in power at the mine. And so I had to go back and go, I can't build a model for this. And I can offer a very interesting insight. We don't care enough about everyone here. Now, at that point in time, you know, what happened for me? So what happened for me in this process, which was months of trying to figure out how to take this further, is in part, it feels like your world crumbling. Because everything that seemed certain, and often that gives us a sense of power or self-efficacy, with the new data becoming available, somehow that has to fall away. And I have to go back to a place where it makes less sense. And I have to figure out how to reintegrate uh, or integrate th this new, not just data, it's new language, it new, it's new ways of seeing, it's new ways of practice that I need to find. So I need to, it, it's almost like I need to learn how to walk again in a world where gravity has changed. Yeah. yeah are just so powerful. So the action logic becomes less about I can rely on these processes and these methodologies and the the ego strategy as a model as well is like yeah. my model of reality is that this is what's important and this is how to get things done. So I mean today I debriefed a, a 612 triple compliance Enneagram social 612. He's done his 612. It's made him very, very effective in leading his area. It's a very analytical area. And now he's leveled up in his leadership role. And he's realizing that 612 doesn't work because now he's dealing with complexity and ambiguity and feelings and politics and how people are evaluating him. And suddenly he said to me today, I've got two left feet. I feel as though I'm learning to walk. M my yeah. his salience landscape, the, uh, John Mavaki's term, his salience landscape yeah. has to change because his strategy is ill-fitted to the ambiguity and complexity of the system, which was always mm -hmm. there. But now he suddenly realized, whoa, there's all this other information going on. And one of the pieces of information is that Bob doesn't like me. Like that's that is salient. So I'm yeah. loving the way you expressing this and the crumbling of the strategy is like it's I also thought of twice. You no, know, like someone's going along doing their job in the bank and suddenly they start having dreams and illnesses and symptoms, and someone says, No, this is twice, your ancestors are calling you. It's like, wait a freaking minute, you know. I don't know yeah. that investors were even there to talk to me. There's the information just like, oh. yeah. So sorry, I'm like getting like totally thrilled with what you say. Yeah. So we've got this process of 
the ground of certainty falling away. And then I see more truth or a different truth in the world. And I have to find ways of integrating, reintegrating, operating inside it. And what this does is there's a rhythm to this, right? So then it, as I become more competent inside the new reality that's visible to me, I recreate certainty. And now I have a sense of agency and efficacy in this version of the world. And then sometimes that crumbles again. And I have to go through the same tune, but it's a new kind of information, a new kind of way of seeing new, new kinds of information that become available and visible to me. And so that's the process. Now, there's a natural rhythm that occurs through most of our lives around this. Yeah. There's, and there's some, some shared ideas in our shared cultures around this of the midlife crisis, for example. The midlife crisis is often a point where the version of reality crumbles and I need to find a way of, and I can do that in different ways, either increasing my capacity for anxiety, uncertainty, my existential ideas in the world, or I can quickly close that up by just picking a new version of life and repeating the old pattern, which is often the, the invitation we go through. It's like, here's all this new information. Do you want to step into the unknown or do you want to just shovel the deck and, and see if you can stick with the old way of seeing and just change the role players? Yeah, so that's, that's like an interesting inflection point that we go through. So, so that's what it feels like. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I love that because I, I imagine that some people here came with the expectation that leveling up feels good. But actually, there's so many archetypes around what you need to give up. And this it's like the archetypal resurrection um, symbol of death and rebirth. Your old way of thinking is going to die and it's not going to be fun. It's going to feel like being crucified. Because you don't know whether or not you're going to rise from the dead. The dark night of the soul, the true dark night of the soul, you can't call it the dark night of the soul. There's no narrative arc. You know, yeah. it's not like, okay, I'm going through a dark night of the soul and things are going to be fine. It's like, yeah, I'll just wake up when the sun rises. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In the tower, in the terror and death, there are all these archetypes of you get to surrender everything. To level up yeah. and it's freaking painful yeah and sometimes it's exhilarating too yeah it's scary and exhilarating it can be a little bit like a, a roller coaster ride where i am screaming but there's part of me that's actually enjoying it too so uh, depending of my what my orientation is towards the new the unfamiliar but i know that it can be exhilarating too but it's scary at the same time and i think for us inside the enneagram world if we've got a very spiritual idea around the levels of health part of the illusion that we might be under is that as we grow it just becomes easier and easier and easier and then right there at the the highest level of health we are liberated mm -hmm. from our ego structures mm -hmm. I'm sorry for you it's not quite how it works you know the process that we go through is it actually to enable this growth we need to increase our capacity for anxiety. We need to increase our capacity to, for brittleness. We need to, you know, so some of the things that existentially we need to expand within us are not that fun. And as I continue to grow, especially if I'm growing into a coherence inside myself that is not so informed by the norms of the world out there, whatever they may be, but for many of us, it's shared in a neoliberal context. It gets more lonely. Sure. And, and there's some questions in the chat around the catalysts for this. Like I like to think in terms of the shock points, the Enneagram can be a shock point. You see, see this thing and you're like, oh my God, this is just one lens and one strategy and one formula for life. And I didn't realize that I was doing this on autopilot. So there's that shock point that shatters your 
strategy as a given. And then in the chat, uh, Libby asking, is it always like that? Don't some of us get weary of the way we think? Yeah. So can you talk about the different ways that yeah. you realize we're at the end of the road of our formula? Yeah. Yeah. So boredom is definitely one of them. Um, I, I love that idea of arranging to get sick and tired of ourselves. I think that is a really valid way through. Sometimes we just have to notice that we are bored and sick and tired of the stories we're telling and the way they're telling, we're telling them and the way in which we're interpreting the world and that that's just no longer cutting it for us. So that's definitely one of the avenues. <laughs> I'm seeing a lot of people nodding there. So mm. I'm imagining there that in, the encounter of stuckness, being tired of making the same mistakes again and again, being bored with our own self with our own experience yeah. of ourselves, like there's got to be more to my existence than this fucking autopilot. Renata is nodding and smiling. Renata, please tell us. Yeah. Tell us yeah well, I mean, no, yeah, we Renata, tell us. But I mean, that is no, what John Bavaki would it. call meaning making and a need, need for meaning that we encounter, the meaninglessness of our existence that we encounter. Renata? Yeah. No, I was just laughing because just yesterday I realized that I, I had a I've had a series of very clever excuses for something uh, that I wasn't doing in my life. Um and and I've just finally ran out of them and got sick and tired of them. And 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 I actually expressed it just like that. So I just I'm relating strongly to what you're saying. That's <laughs> classic. And Megan, I saw also like uh-huh nodding about the boredom point. I, I just love to hear how people are resonating with what, what's being said here. I don't know if you want to share there, Megan. What made you what made you have that look of uh, boredom? <laughs> <laughs> well it's that pressure, right? It's that it is that it's that heat experience, right? I will I, that is what that's what brings the energy for me to start fighting back for my life. Mm. Whoa. What does that mean? Fighting back for your life. I love that. I like got a big happiness. <laughs> I I experience that is the whether that's just the the boredom or the struggle or the just the right the catastrophe of living. And it gets to where you just notice that you're just getting smaller and smaller, and you know that that is not you. Uh, and that's where you start fighting back. Beautiful. Yeah. So, so, Lucille, which part of us do you have some kind of teleological view? And I know I do that there's an essential part of us, there's this inner necessity to be alive, to be connected to our life force, to, you know, and I see it as part of the impingement in early childhood, the, the degradation of our instincts. There's like a whole Enneagram way of seeing this. How do you see this part of us that would want to fight for our lives? Um, I, I would offer today a very non-psychologized view <laughs> around that so there is the there's the there is a truth in the psychological view and sometimes it's just the movement of breath through our beings so that thing in in the center of us that 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 has the urge of life in it is the breath inside us and it leaves us with our breath in this body and in this form, at least. Love that. And the, the spiritual traditions that recognize that the ruach, the pneuma, the breath of life, you know, and that, that, that there's, yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah. And I, I, think, I think there's a spiritual version of interpreting that and a very physiological way too. I want to talk about one or two other mechanisms for inviting us into different stages to just like go back there boredom is one doorway right to just go I'm sick and tired of this it's not working I'm 
I'm I'm I'm out of excuses, as Renata said. There's something else that wants to be born, or there's this thing inside me that I that I'm going to that that that's worth living for, and I'm attaching to that. The second way in which this happens is quite naturally. Things will happen in your life that will shatter your world. Your parents will die. You will at some point potentially you know, lose your job. There will be a tsunami. There will be things that shift and change. And each of them is like a doorway or an invitation to go, you may want to, you, you, you have the invitation to go through this doorway of a naturally occurring experience that shatters your way of making sense and to see what else is available on the other side of that. And that is the the kind of thriving and the kind of growth that I think it's sometimes called post-traumatic growth. It's not just post-traumatic stress that comes from that, but that that idea of realizing, wow, you know, there are no parents anymore in this life. I better start parenting myself. Massive, massive invitation. The third one, which is incredibly popular at the moment. Um, and and useful, but also very dangerous doorway is the doorway of peak experiences, often that come through um, altered state of consciousness. And at the moment, you know, if there's a big fad out there, it's like, let's find some kind of plant medicine and use that to give us a sense of what we're not seeing in the world. Now, what those kinds of altered states um, invite us to, it's beautiful, it's a peak experience, but it's not a stage shift. It's an elastic, it's like an elastic band that takes me to a different way of relating to the world, a different action logic. And then as the medicine leaves me, I'm back in the life that I had. And often what I take with me is I take some markers of what might be useful or who I am to, it doesn't necessarily all leave me. And it's a little bit like using chat GPT to do your history homework some of the time. Yeah. yeah? Especially yeah. if we're doing it in a way that is cultural appropriation as well, or that is not sensitive to the way in which it belongs inside cultures. Mm -hmm. And there's such an interesting thing that I, um, I encountered through listening to the work of, of, an amazing person that does a lot of work in South America and is from an indigenous culture there saying, the interesting thing is that a lot of Western people are coming to her people for plant medicines. And when it's used in their cultural context, often what the plant medicine offers is a, an invitation to through the pain, connect deeper into the community and therefore to expand. And then a lot of people come there from outside the culture and they all want to use the plant medicine to climb back into the womb. And climbing back into the womb is such an interesting way of thinking about it. That's actually a regression. Like I want to, I want to be in the place where I don't have to live my life. Um, and, and so I think we need to be very careful of that. But I mean, I, I get a little bit worried when I hear that, you know, YPO is sending all of the, the, the young up and coming leaders of the world on ketamine trips. I'm, I am potential. I just want to say that out there. I think there is a place for those peak experiences and some of them you can attain in very natural ways, just through breathing in a particular way. Yeah. Just to be very clear on that. And it's useful, but it doesn't create a stage shift that's sustainable. It shows us something. Yeah. And the question then is how to find the path between those. Exactly. And that's Naranjo. You know, Naranjo is one of the early pioneers in using psychedelics. And he yeah. really writes about this psyche delos. And I've got that in yeah. my writing course is the Enneagram does it for us. The word delos in Greek means reveal. And yeah. so what happens with psychedelics is they they let us see our way of thinking. So we experience like, oh my God, this is how I've been seeing the world and it's not true. So it does 
create that positive dissociation from the ego and the habits of mind. So he writes about it almost as if psychedelics are a holiday from our usual yeah. thinking. So it can relativize that and we can start having that initial split where we're able to objectify things in ourselves that can be objectified. Like yeah. I can objectify my essence, but I can say I'm so sick of this six way of thinking, you know, um, and and then being able to name it and push it to the horizon, as Helen Palmer said, yeah. allows us yeah. to know that, you know, something else might be going on. Yeah. And I think that is part of, you know, if we go back to Naranjo's work, he called his program Seeking After the Truth, Seekers After the Truth. We bring that into conversation with this idea of action logics. More of the truth becomes visible to me as I progress in my journey. Mm -hmm. That is really the deeper ethos inside the Enneagram is the invitation towards more of the truth, a return to a relationship with truth. And we've We've kind of like a little onion closed ourselves off from that through our ego structures. And we need to un unpeel that again. Yes. Um, and, 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 yeah. And what Naranjo Seekers After the Truth program did, and that's the fourth way that is available to us for um, leveling up, is to create a, a, a heat invitation with multiple layers of heat, that's enough to disrupt my way of seeing and open up new ways of seeing and then safe enough to help me to integrate and put that back together. And so each of his Seekers After the Truth programs was a particular logic around how to do that in some kind of way. And think about some of the, some of the ideas within that. Some of it's really weird. Like you are going to get a clown as a coach. That's really bizarre and lovely because that's one way to figure out how to get sick and tired of ourselves. Have your coach be dressed up as a clown and acting as a clown. Um, and sometimes I think, you know, and there's that and there's a rebirthing experience and there's, there's all these elements and there's, there's the mindfulness practice and the conversational teaching and all these layers together that is an invitation to go through heat into an opening through a birthing process into more of the truth being revealed and then creating the scaffolding so that we can take that with us as opposed to just slipping back to how it was before after a really wonderful course. Yes. So that word, you, you speak about disruption. So it's disrupting our default, well, for me, in the Enneagram language, our reality strategy, our ways of seeing, our action logic. So heat will disrupt our, it's like when you boil water, it disrupts the water. It disrupts yeah. our whole paradigm. And through that creates more, like the things they say are the absolutely crucial skills for the 21st century paradigm agility, cognitive agility, tolerance of ambiguity. If you've only got one way of seeing the world, you can't be agile and you can't relate to other people who have a very different, they're diff standing on different epistemological ground. They, they, yeah. They're completely on a different map of reality. So this disruption, yeah. I, I see like what you're talking about, get the images of breaking open my way of seeing so that I can see more, but pointing to the risk of doing that via a shattering experience of psychedelics is like, okay, my whole worldview just got shattered. Now what? So, yeah. 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 And, and that's where there's a particular rhythm to this. And the rhythm is disrupt, contain, disrupt, contain. It's like, if we think about within the African cosmology, fire has an opposite and the opposite in the cosmology is earth so you have to disrupt fire and then you have to contain earth you have to expand and integrate which is where we started off this conversation so it's come like an interesting full circle Look at yeah. That, yeah like for me these spaces of togetherness and meaning making is our containing of the fact that we 
we're grappling with the fact that we're walking around with Enneagram types and we kind of want to experience other ways of being. But we can we do that in the safe container of testing our realities and laughing about our reality. So we clown around with each other. We make fun of our reality strategies in a safe container. Like yeah. Yeah. our community. This is our tribe. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that is one place of making sure that the heat that we have is, is viable. Yeah. So, I mean, there are ways in which sometimes when we take too much of our power as coaches, as facilitators, if we become reckless with our power, we think we can just throw heat and heat and heat and heat into the system. And that's where our methodologies then re-traumatize um, and where we become we become like dangerous frameworks. You know, my job is just to disrupt. It's like really to understand the dance and also to understand how much disruption is there already in this system um, for this human being. Because sometimes the disruption is there, no heat is needed. I actually need to bank the fire. I actually need to bring containment here. Um, as opposed to just going heat, heat, heat is the way through. And that's part of my critique of adult development work. Um, there's this beautiful article by Nick Petrie around how do we support vertical development? And part of the formula is heat experiences. Now, there's so much heat in some systems that more heat creates wildfire. Mm -hmm. And that's then, that's then something that causes regression into trauma, into earlier stage, states where I feel safe again. Exactly. And what I've found in the coaching environment is the more that I explore existing heat, the more validating it is and unshaming, like asking about, so what growth experiences have you had where your sense of yourself changed? Mm. Everybody's got them. And, and just yeah. being with the clients, that question is like a differentiating question because then people start saying, and then I discovered this, and then I discovered that about myself, and I was standing in the kitchen and I realized, you know, I fuck this shit, or whatever, like an Enneagram too, who'd spent, who was cooking for 40 people and no one, you know, it's yeah. like the two thing is not working for me. I'm not happy. Um, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I don't need to say one single thing about Enneagram too. She really, mm the whole thing so I love what you're saying about we don't need to put heat in Ooh. not always yeah Ingrid I lost you there for a moment but I love what uh, Lee's put in the chat there Gurdjieff suggested that it's rude to wake others up um and I I can definitely I have teenagers in the house um I know that sometimes a little bit of rudeness is the only way we start the day and I know that it's terribly rude still. So it's very useful. Um, uh, Karen, I'll pop the article in the chat in a moment. I love what Anne is also asking there. If one has gone through a natural growth path and feels like they've reached a peak, what does containing look like? And that's an incredibly important question, Anne. Thank you so much for that. Sometimes our role as coaches walking alongside our clients' journeys is to, to offer, offer them the support to say, your job is not to go anywhere else right now. It's not to strive. It's not necessarily to grow more. The question is, and, and there's no formula for how we do this with our clients, but it's to invite our clients into a period of rest and integration. Um, and I think that's where from the natural world and in, when we work in, on more of a mythic plane, there's a natural cycle to things. There's summer and then there's the time of harvest that we get in autumn and then there's winter. And winter is sometimes a time of hibernation, of saying no striving, no next big goal. You just finished, you know, your MBA the next thing is not the next thing. The next thing is to really figure out how to work with what you've got right now and to, and to allow it to sink into your being. Um, and you'll know, our clients know when the rhythm requires them to move again. 
it's like, okay, now the context and I are out of sync again. Um, or now I'm bored and sick and tired of it. Um, and so we have the innate wisdom to know what is required. And that's why when I work with clients, I say to them often, is this a time of expansion and stretch or is this the time of rest and integration for you? What do you need most right now? And I don't need to have that answer, but that's the question. I can't go into that conversation with the assumption that the next thing is to move. That is, that it's not just rude, but that's, that's actually disempowering, dangerous, colonial, you know, that, that's actually colonizing another human being with my agenda for them. Very, very dangerous. Um, Brian, is it still rude to invite awakening in others with their permission and at their request? Now, I think that is a very good point, Brian. It's definitely fine then. Like, that is also the only way I get my teenager out of bed. He said, mom, please help me because the alarm isn't working. You know, and that's why people come to coaching sometimes. It's like, I am sick and tired of this. I want to explore something new. Yeah. And, and let's go on this journey together. Yeah, but yeah, from, great. from a cancer transference perspective, from a trauma-informed perspective, when someone comes to you and gives you their power, how do you be very, very conscious of what's going on in that moment? Because an Enneagram 6 will walk into the room and say, tell me what the next step is on my growth path. And if you don't yeah. notice what's happening, that they they giving you authority over their inner life and what is the biggest problem for sixes is that they're out of touch with their inner authority Refu mm. refuse their power give it back to them um yeah no. yep. if someone comes to you and they say please can you tell me what my type is my question is what are you hoping to have differently or, or experience through knowing your type what's What's underneath that? You know, I don't say what's underneath that, but I'll explore in the process with them what are they after? You know, by knowing their type, I'm not just gonna jump into this the question, the content. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And so once again, it's like what is what is the role I see for myself in this? Am I a journey companion? Yeah, and in the journey. There's been a request to be an accountability partner to sometimes I go, are you still awake? Or is it to actually take your agency from you and put it in my hands? I absolutely agree with you, Ingrid. Very, very dangerous. Mm -hmm. So we have about 10 minutes left and I'm wondering where you think we should go in these last 10 minutes of the conversation. Well, yeah, thanks for noticing the time. Um, it would be wonderful to... Just explore any questions um, mm. people might have. And uh, yeah, anyone sitting with something that you feel is, is a significant gap in, in what you were hoping to discover here. Um, let's start there. And then after that, you know, we'll be at time then, I'm sure. Then maybe you and I can hang around a little bit and ask people you know what they're walking away with so let's start with questions and if you can try and condense the question in a way that's easy to answer or, or, or that there's a there's a clarity around what the question is and feel free, free to unmute yourself if you want to ask it or type it if you if you have one yeah just raise your hands let's yeah. take hands Who's got a question? Yeah, Kristen. This is incredible. Thank you so much. Um, I just want more. Like, what are non-psychological ways to add heat? Mm. Breath is excellent. Very applicable. Yeah. So, I mean, I can share a couple of thoughts. I'm sure Ingrid has and any, anyone else that has some non-psychological ways, pop it in there. So all of the somatic practices are, are helpful and useful here. 
a lot of what informs me is also more of a, a mythical um, and ceremonial lens. Yeah. So um, I think some of the some of the ways in which I've invited into heat for on the land processes that we do. So come, what are your questions? What are you celebrating? Go find a rock, take away your food, go sit there for four days, come back, tell me the story of that experience, right? So that's an extreme amount of heat and that's something people need to choose um, for themselves. But there, there are ways in which ceremony absolutely does that. And there are there are ways in which we we can hold space for people um, in that way. I also um, find that, and and I think that's where sometimes, if we strip away our ideas of the cleverness and the contribution we need to make and how useful we need to feel as coaches, sometimes, you know, some of the the most profound ways of adding heat is just through being silent and shutting up and offering just the quiet space for people to add their own heat. Like just the silence is enough heat for something to bubble up into that space. Um, and I mean, from a developmental perspective, there are many, many ways in which we can play with this. Um, there are universal bombs that are interculturally shared around singing and dancing and storytelling and you know making music together that are useful here there are lots of ways in which we can invite people into conversation with something that is greater and anxiety provoking for them and often that can be in nature in some kind of way yeah so there's there's that that kind of way there are spiritual practices for this there's shamanic practices for it um, I think the core thing just to, and sometimes it's as simple as moving the conversation between me and my client from sitting together in a room to walking alongside each other out in nature. And, you know, it's the same conversation, but it's a different conversation because of how we're doing and, and what we're doing. There are other ways in, of adding heat that's just to do with pacing things slower for our more assertive quick pace types like the eight threes and sevens, speeding it up for the nines, sometimes for the ones, for the fours, you know, the slower types. So you can just, pacing is a way of adding and withholding heat. Yeah, Ingrid, some of your thoughts around this. Uh, I think for me, what's really, been significant for me is the disruption of my lens so oh my god can I ever begin a sentence without saying John Bavaki he speaks about how we're wearing the glasses and they're transparent to us so we're seeing the world and we think we're seeing the world then the the disruption is taking off the glasses and the, he calls it an opacity so we realize suddenly this is a thing and and then, like, oh, my God, without that, everything looks different. And the things that have done that for me most powerfully are working with the unconscious. And I know that the mythic is also tapping into the archetypal and the unconscious, but things like hypnosis and work with dreams, because starting to trust that there's another intelligence. And, like, in, in hypnosis, we say, Part of the induction process is do you have the support of your deepest inner mind and wisdom to go into that deep trance in order to discover the wisdom? And, and you know, I've never had a client who said no. And because it's, it's a resource, there's so much there where we start to realize that the the part of us that is doing these compulsive habits that we want to change, we discover the action logic of that part of us and its protective role. And then we start to see which part of us it's protecting. So it's it's so below the mindset of, you know, I need to be less lazy. Like, no, 
you know, a client comes to me and they say, oh, I've got no energy. I just want to lie on the couch and, you know, I'm supposed to be looking for a new job. And my instantaneous instinct is, can I speak to the one that wants to lie on the couch? And, you know, it's, it's not taking the conscious objectives for granted. And, you know, like I, I learned a lot of that from Tom Condon as well, because, you know, go to him and say, can you, can you finally tell me what's wrong with me? You know, this is my full feeling style is I'm so tired of myself. What's wrong with me? And he's like, sits there wisely. And he says, you've got SWI. I'm like, yay. Now I'm going to write this down. You know, it's not in the DSM-5. I've finally hit on the answer of what I need to fix. So what's that? He says, something wrong inside. It's just like, like I'm not buying. Your entire strategy is misguided. Your question is a misinformed outcome. And then it's like, okay, we, we, we're doing something else now. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, so those for me are the powerful things. It's like, completely disrupting the question yeah yeah and that's really beautiful and some of those things you know can can um you know it seems like we're going through a psychological lens but it's also being playful and working at an ar archetypal or a, a parts level uh with with some things lee your question we probably have time for one more and then we'll just wrap up I just wanted to just quickly mention to, to Kristen on her question, I think what's very powerful is to pay extreme attention. So a question like, I noticed um, a big sigh. Yeah. Tell me about what that sigh is. What's behind that sigh? And I, I just find watching the body, it can be also very, very powerful in helping people shift. Yeah, absolutely. Working in the here and now with what is expressing in the moment is very powerful. I concur, Lee. Thanks for offering that. Yeah, so um, some playful ways in which one can work, um, working with poetry, working with art, uh, working with flower arrangement, taking a group of Kosa women who are scared of the water, surfing. There's many things that one can do that are not necessarily in the realm of the psychological, but that have deep and profound impacts on our egos and our ego structures. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes the invitation that we have inside our Enneagram community is we think all of the work needs to happen inside the personality. And what we forget is that the Enneagram is not just a personality framework. It's also a process framework that invites us to bring in shock points at point three and six and it's also a symbol. It's just a symbol as well. And that symbol, just walking to different points on the symbol can help us see different things, not in a psychological way, but literally through being in a different point in relation to that. So there's an invitation to say, in which ways can I level up my relationship with the Enneagram as well? Um, and if I do that, then there's a lot more resources. Um, it will densify and cohere inside me in a way that allows me to support my clients in a different way too. So it's useful to get sick and tired of the formulaic stories and examples that we use inside each of the points for us as people that work with the Enneagram a lot. Mm -hmm. And if, if you hear yourself say the same thing over and over again, you know, arrange to get sick and tired of that relationship with the Enneagram or with your own Enneagram style. Um, that's really powerful. And you might feel a little bit lost when you try doing it or explaining it in a different way, but you will become more precise. Um, and it's a lovely thing. It's a, it's a lovely journey. And that's, that's like coming back to Dialogos. It's, Dialogos is ever renewing. And for me, that's what the Enneagram is about. It's about evolving holy harmony holy law holy plan holy wisdom is like when we drop into an experience of things not being static and flowing with the now and experience ourselves unfolding like this conversation for me is like uh, you know experiencing the ways in which it's changing me there's so much beauty and joy in 
in that encounter. And it's just, I'm so grateful. Yeah, I am too. Thank you for allowing me to explore things that I didn't know I was in conversation with because that's the way it rolled. So I see people are needing to drop off. Um, so yeah, from my side, thank you so much for being part of our space of thinking together. And we'll, yeah, Ingrid, I don't know if there's anything you want to say. We'll close it off. And then if anyone wants to hang around just for a couple of minutes afterwards, we will. And we'll stop the recording before we do that. So the formal part is just this uh, real thank you for yeah everything that you've shared with us and your being and your integrity and speaking from a place of real heart like embodied connectedness um it's it's such a it's it's just so meaningful and enriching and thank you for that and um, yeah that's that's what i want to say and thank you everybody for being here and caring about this work. Uh, that's, thank you. So yeah, right back at you, Ingrid. I can say all of those words to you as well. So thank you so much. And thank you everyone for being part of the field that allowed this conversation Excellent. to unfold. So yeah. anyone who wants to just talk about what you what you're walking away with, how this, how this experience of being here has opened something in yourself. I'll hang around for a bit, Lucille, as long as you want to. You like to kind of close things in your way. I like to kind of hang around for ages. So yeah. <laughs> don't feel compelled to have to hang around. But I'd love yeah. to hear from anyone about what's happened for you. Mark. Yeah. Thank you, Lucille. Well, this was really wonderful. Thank you so much. I learned so much from this uh, webinar. Uh, I did have a question, and I was a little reluctant to share it initially. Um, I've been studying vertical development on my own for about 10 years now through you know, Sue Wilbur, Kagan, and so on. Mm. I work with a lot of uh, communities of color, yeah. and you're probably familiar with the criticism from Nora Bateson, yeah. who said that uh, stage theories is colonial as hell. Yeah. And I've, I've read what she said. I've listened to some of the other criticisms and I don't, don't necessarily agree with her, but she makes some really valid points. Yeah. How do you introduce this? Because most of the groups that I work with are communities of color. Mm. How, do you, how do you introduce this and yet address some of those same criticisms? Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll offer one or two different thoughts. The one is actually um, something that I got from a wonderful Finnish practitioner called Ans Ansi Bulk. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I see Sari has dropped off. She probably knows him. But what Ansi, um, what Ansi says is one of the useful ways to work with this is to go, here is the stage you're in, the stage before and the stage after, but to never offer it in a vertical way. Mm. And to offer before and after and to allow the person to make sense of that and to offer them the opportunity to say how they want to relate to what they learn from that. Sure. So there's no end point and beginning point, but it's like here before and after. And I think that's a really pragmatic way of taking, stripping out some of that, that idea of verticality and mm -hmm. better and worse out of it. So that's the first. I think this, the second one has to do with the way in which we, we, we work with, it as a and and that's where our own language and our own ways of introducing it is incredibly important the moment we have an idea of later is better and earlier is worse it doesn't work and it is colonial and it is prescriptive and it is disempowering and it is judgmental so the language that is useful for me is to say does the current way, does your current action logic serve your context? Or does the context require something different from you? If the context requires something different from you, 
you may want to explore what's around you in the framework. And it's an, in, it's, it's an invitation. So like to, to treat each action logic as the perfect way in which I meet my context until, the, until it doesn't work anymore. Yeah? yeah. So that's, that's a second way of working with it. Um, and I think the, the, the third way is an inner job. And that the inner job has to do with my intentions as the practitioner. And how clear I am. If I have an intention for you, mm -hmm. regardless of whether it's the Enneagram or a vertical model or whatever, I'm lost because that is the colonial space. So the only my 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 role that I need to keep in check is what is your desire for you and therefore what might be helpful. I don't know. And it's not perfect. I don't think there is a perfect answer. Yeah. I think that the core thing is that as we as we are in the conversation between different different cultures, different experiences of power, different ways of being seen and unseen in a system, um, it is, yeah, it, it's just to be super aware of how how power is distributed in that space. And I guess that is also just in part why what we built into our way of working with this includes the integration of liberation ethics into the way of working with the model to speak particularly to um, communities and groups that have been disempowered. Because part of what happens for us as we grow is we can reclaim agency and we infuse, as, as Steve Biko would say, we, we pump pride back into ourselves and we we re-inhabit ourselves uh, as as fully embodied human beings as opposed to as objects that have been objectified in the system. And if we can if we can bring that into the conversation, so it's not just ego development, it's actually the reclamation of agency and the freeing ourselves from the positioning we've been placed in, um, either as privy or as someone who who is disempowered in the system, all of that is forms of objectification. So if we can bring liberation ethics and ego development into conversation with each other, it does feel significantly different to just, this is my idea of what an evolved human being looks like, mm -hmm. yeah. which in some of the ego development work and even some of the spiral dynamics is really, really problematic. Yeah. I've got a, also another thought on that, Mark, which is slightly different to Lucille, but it's complementary. Um, given exactly what she said, there's there's no kind of answer to this, but we, we're conscious of the colonizing discourse and we want to not do it. For me, it's relativizing the Enneagram. And as a head type, that's kind of something that I like to do anyway, is to say, people meet the Enneagram and I say, okay, this thing is like a map of maps, like Tom Condon says. It's a map of nine or 27 ways of looking at the world. And it's helping us to see how we look at the world. And it's mm -hmm. a, I, I kind of describe it as a model. This is what it tells us. It's a three-centered model of being human. It tells us we've got a cranial brain and some some of the kinds of stuff that goes on there. It tells us about the cardiac brain and, you know, some people like to think of that in neurophysiological terms, like the polyvagal theory. So it's allowing us to have some sense of what's happening in our chest, literally, like when does our heart soften? When do we get anxious? Um, what is our feeling orientation to the world? And then the gut center is our movement, our way of doing things. So it's to say what the Enneagram kind of helps us to do in terms of thinking about what we are. And then like saying, okay, the Enneagram gives us a menu. Uh, we think in a five, six or seven way. There might be a thousand ways, but the Enneagram menu says these are kind of three ways of thinking. And you might, you might recognize some of that stuff. And it might be helpful for you when you when you see that that's one way of thinking. Like, if your mind is all over the place and grasping and grabbing at the tree of illusion and thinking about the future, 
the Enneagram describes that kind of experience of thinking as seven. And then they're like, oh, okay, cool. Or yeah, sort of. And, and using the Enneagram in that way is like, does this help you make sense of your experience of yourself? And, and then if they want to know more, then it's like, well, the Enneagram describes alternative states. For example, when you're feeling calm and when your mind is clear and available to you, and the Enneagram has a name for that. And, and then people don't feel that it's being imposed. It's like, I respect you and your, your agency in choosing how you want to use this stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll just offer two short things. So, Mark, the first thing is that Nora's critique um, in part into the adult development community is 100% correct in that what we've seen is that a lot of the um, older, apparently from an ego development perspective, more mm -hmm. mature individuals that are teaching some of the stuff mm -hmm. are incredibly retarded when it comes to <laughs> issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So that literally... When, when we look at our sentences, and you know some of our sentences have stuff in there around, you know, a, around race and ethnicity and around gender. And then we look at what the teachers say when it comes to issues, issues of ethnicity. And they go, it's not part of people's identities and lived experience because they live in older, privileged, white bodies that have not had to have that experience. Yep. And so the idea of uneven strands of development is massive and useful in response to Nora's critique, because what we can see is some people in communities of color have had to radically grow in terms of that aspect of themselves and knowing how to navigate power and, and figure out how to survive in the world in ways that, that a more privileged community is not. And at the same time, because of that, may not have had the same opportunities for um, for example, exposure to further education and a whole lot of things that can support other strands like cognitive development or whatever. And so if we think of everyone as an uneven tapestry, that becomes useful. And I can know which strands, so then we start talking about range. In, in, which, in the range, which of the strands of your life are very developed mm -hmm. and which of the strands are lagging behind. And yeah. that's a very different and equalizing conversation because mm -hmm. there is no human being, including all of us here, but definitely including me, that have all these long strands. I am deeply retarded in some of my strands of my carpet. And if, if we can have that conversation, that's useful because then we can also say, so dear, and Dave Snowden has many of the, you know, maybe Dave doesn't think about social justice in quite the same way. But we can say, Dave, you have a very long strand when it comes to your cognitive development. Wow, you're brilliant. And sometimes socially, you are an ass. And here's your short strand. Do you want to grow and develop some of that? Because, you know, this funny carpet is actually quite messy. And that's, that's a nice conversation that I find useful. Mm -hmm. And to be affirming in that and to say explicitly, there are some of your strands of development that is way more advanced than this other pe person here that may leave you in a position of feeling slightly insecure because they have this kind of terminology or this kind of way of being in the world. But this is where your strands are long. So it's almost a deconstruction that can make the work useful in that kind of community. So like which of the strands are useful? And that's where ANSI also this Finnish guy, he works on meta competencies that support the development. So he says, you never have to look at what stage you're at. But if we give you 16 meta competencies that all support the equalizing of the strands, one of them could be, for example, your, your ability to be in difficult conversations around issues of inclusion, you know, your inclusivity mindset, let's call it. That's one competency. And self-awareness is another. And, you know, moral development and cognitive development is another. 
you never have to look at where the, the assessment will pinpoint you. You need to use the assessment to, to give you direction inside the menu of meta competencies. And I think that's a very useful way of thinking about it. Tom Condon speaks about how growing as an adult is about filling in the gaps in your education. So using the Enneagram in that way as well to say, so, you know, my 837 clients generally are very well educated in assertiveness because they had to grow fast. So just offering that and, you know, very often because the Enneagram is so accurate, they're like, holy crap, how did you know about my childhood? Um, and just validating that that's a, that's a really good strategy, but then this meta competency of being able to notice when it's not working. Like for me, that's a critical meta competency as well as a meta competency for me is noticing what state I'm in, the self-awareness. When do I feel like I'm responsive and in touch with reality versus in a stance? So, like for me, that's one of the most important Enneagram meta competencies. Tom teaches that as well is know the difference between when you're in the trance of your type and when you're not. If you have that meta competency, you've got the Enneagram. Then, you know, then you're on your. Yeah, yeah. Oh, when I'm fully in seven, I have a dry mouth and everything looks like there's like a white light and a. I forgot that I have a body. And so it's like when you when you notice the difference between the trance and oh, I'm actually here, then um you start realizing what the Enneagram is actually about. Yeah. Yeah. The Neve, did you also have a question, comment, something? It's so lovely no. to see you. I just want to say that a hundred times. Absolutely. It's so lovely to see you. Oh. Um, Ingrid, just for context, Lucille was my first Enneagram trainer. So she introduced me to the Enneagram a few, few full moons ago. Yeah. Uh, I'm just you know, so, so grateful for the, the, the flexibility and the openness and that adaptability that I hear in everything that is being, being said here. I think quite often what triggers my own inferiority is out there in the world how the certainty people speak with, and especially psychologists, coaches, people in healing industries and the way they market themselves and so it's almost like more and more like I feel like I can actually land in my true value because I think that's something I'm really great with this they sit in this mystery and the unknown and let's not <clears throat> allow the organic unfolding and being grounded in that and and I've always had this disqualifying thing oh but you should be like uh, the the threes, eights, and sevens, you know, to, <laughs> if you want to do well and get enough clients and make enough money, blah, blah, blah. So, so um, it's, it's almost like in the presence of tonight and listening to you, I'm also, it's like I can also connect more. Yeah, I feel more grounded actually in my own journey and in my own values. So, mm. so thank you very much for that. Very much grateful. Mm. And, and then just another comment, just what I'm taking away for myself is almost like, this, the whole thing around st stages of development, I find it very valuable for me. If I look back at my journey, oh, there's some shifts happened. There's some shifts happened. Yeah. But like at, at every space and season I was in, I had to be in that moment and face whatever I had to face, the sadness, the depression, the sickness or whatever it was. And eventually looking back, oh, oh, that's what happened. And, yeah. and, and I love that idea. Well, you specifically said not to use it as prescriptive. And I think I always, um, I've always had resistance inside of me if people kind of use it in a prescriptive sense. I remember, you know, the seal deal now, but the first time in life that the certainty um, crumbled underneath me when I was in my 20s and, you know, I had my first, first existential crisis, people told me, oh, no, 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 you know, oh, you're just going to the critical, you know, faith stage. But soon you'll get to your second naivety and you'll, you know, believe the right things again and you'll have um, faith, certainty or what. You know, I can't remember the exact words. And, and even then I looked at them and said, you know, maybe I should get to that point one day. But if I have to arrive there again, it must be organically <laughs> or it must be, you know, but right now 
life doesn't make sense and I'm critical and I'm skeptical and I have so much questions and I'm not going to pretend that, you know, things are making sense to me now, I'll pretend just to embrace this naivety. And, and I think from that kind of unwillingness to just force a goal on me, I just stepped into the unknown and that is still unfold, unfolding 15 years, 15 years later. And, and I love it. And I, and I just reconnected with what I also want to offer most for clients is to really be with that embodiment of their path and what they are facing and not coming enforcing something on them so i'm very much relieved and grateful with everything tonight thank you and the word the word there is the should and the minute i hear the word should it's like let's just stop everything like either when clients should themselves you know like they apply a should to themselves I should be like an 837. I should be getting these results. For me, it's like, okay, let's just stop for a second. Where does the should come from? There's some inner critic super ego that's got a it's got a protective role and it's got a positive agenda, but it's overdoing its role somehow because that for me is the panel beating, the fixing, the instruction manual. It's not organic. Nobody stands next to a rose and says, it's springtime now, you should be blossoming. <laughs> it's not organic. So, yeah, I, I love what you're saying there. It's, uh, it's more lovely. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Renier. And a thousand blessings on your journey. Wherever oh, it takes you. <laughs> By the way, it took me after 10 years, I uh, shifted from the two into the nine space. It, it, you know, it's, it's been actually one of the unfoldings that just happened out of the blue last year. And, and that was kind of a main theme. And, um, and that's kind of broke so many things open for me, the kind of embarrassment, been an Enneagram coach for 10 years. Oops, oops, <laughs> I've mistyped myself. So. Happens to the best of us. <laughs> There yeah. are other people on this call that had that have had that same journey. Absolutely. It's very useful to 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 also question our own onion layers and to see more of ourselves, see how your identity complexified. Absolutely. And it's been all valuable and I'm grateful for that. And it also takes us more actual pressure away from me for allowing people the journey and whether to report or narrative or whatever, but go disagree, engage with it. <laughs> Yeah. Um, meet not, meet not, yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. Brian, I think Brian has a question and then I'm going to jump yeah. in. Hi, thank you so much. This has been this, this has been such a useful session for me because I'm I'm so passionate about the levels of development. Um, I, I particularly like the idea, Lucille and Ingrid around, um, you know, this continuum and not and giving the before stage and the after stage and getting people to see where they are and the, the thought i had and, and the strands the issue the, mm. the thing around the strands that you mentioned the idea that comes to my mind i'm not sure whether we can explore this at some other point and i i definitely will in my own research is if we take the centers of expression uh, you know the head heart and the gut and we speak about so w w where is somebody in the levels of development vis-a-vis -vis these three centers of expression. Mm. That might mm. be an idea to this experience, yeah. people, isn't it? Yeah, that's lovely. Like, like, and, and I mean, in some way, that's part of what, um, you know, the first time I encountered those ideas was with Uranio Payez. And so the idea of if you work on the process Enneagram, it is to go from the distorted gut, the distorted instincts, to the healthy imbalance instincts that you know so that's that's the the one continuum so the gut the body center is the the instincts unhealthy instincts distorted instincts to healthy instincts and then the heart center it's the same thing it's from it's from the clouded heart the heavy heart you know all of those things into the higher expression of the heart center and for him that is part of the journey that has to do with how we relate to the vice of the type and how our relationship is with the virtue of the type. And then in the head center, it's also to get to the higher head center, it's the journey in freeing ourselves from the fixation of the type into the holy idea of the type. Yeah. 
and and that's maybe an enneagram way of looking at it but we all have like what is the what is my relationship with my with my heart right now what is my relationship with my head am i am i lost obsessive you know there's there's very simple ways in which we can work with that and that's a very beautiful way of thinking of it i like it brian i like it a lot good great thinking thank you yeah yeah, yeah. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you guys for hanging, hanging around a bit longer. The richness of your engagement. Um, yeah, it's lovely to share the space with you. Get to meet you as well, properly, Renia and Mark. Appreciate it a lot. Thanks for sticking around. So thank you, Ingrid. Yeah. yeah. Will you stop the recording, Ings? Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you, guys.